Good morning, and welcome to Worship at River Glen. I'm Megan Peruca, a member of the church. I'm joining you from the campus of the University of Rochester in New York, where I'm settling in to start my college adventure. It's wonderful to be able to worship together from our many different locations today. Let us give thanks for the gift of life we share as we lift up our praises to Almighty God. As the prophet Isaiah reminds us, God is always at work, joyfully creating new life around us and within us, a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation where all God's people join together to declare his praise. We join in that course of praise with all of creation as we worship our Lord and Savior this glad day. Please pray with me. O oh Lord God, we rejoice in your gift of creation that surrounds us and fills us every day. You are bringing forth new life in more ways than we can possibly count. As you breathe your loving spirit into our midst, our hearts are renewed, our minds are refreshed, and our bodies are re-energized for the praise of your glory. Fill us up to overflowing with your love now, as we open our hearts to receive the new life that comes to us this day through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May that love draw us close to you and to one another as we lift up our praises and thanksgivings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi youth group, here we are again, not in church, but you know as I've gotten older I realize I've worshipped in school gyms, in church basements, outdoors, and I think God hears me just fine in all of those places. I think he hears you just fine in all of those places too. See I've come to understand what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 18:20, where two or three are gathered there I am amongst them. Obviously I'm not wearing my Sunday best here and you may in fact be in your PJs. But that outward appearance doesn't matter at all so long as we're bringing our hearts to God. See that's what makes church church. It's not the building, it's the people.
And since we don't need the church as a physical structure, I can be outside and show you a couple of bridges. I've been thinking a lot about bridges lately. You've got the Golden Gate on the west coast, Brooklyn Bridge on the east, and then there's this little one in between in Selma, Alabama. It's named after a man who helped lead the Ku Klux Klan. I don't want to remember the name of that bridge here so much as I want to remember one of many who attempted to cross it in 1965, John Lewis. Here's a guy demonstrating for equality, marching, praying, and for that, he got a skull fracture and scars he bore for the rest of his life. So Christians believe that they serve as a bridge between God and the rest of the world. Did you know that the word priest in Hebrew refers to someone who bridges a gap for someone else? Think about that idea for a minute. Bridging a gap. The word gap, right? We hear about gaps in our understanding, an achievement gap, a gap year in college, the generation gap. Like these are defects. The thing is, I've come to understand that gaps are necessary parts of life because that's where we provide grace when someone stumbles. So you could say that when John Lewis crossed that bridge, he was trying to bridge a gap in our own understanding. A gap that is often wider than we're willing to admit. But as Christians, that's the kind of work we should be familiar with. So I ask you, are you bridging a gap right now? Could you be? Where would it lead? Instead of iron and steel, could you bridge a gap with your words? With a text? With a socially distanced walk? Even a soda and a snack between two friends can often bridge a gap. And some of the strongest bridges are built with prayer. Just remember, wherever you're going, take someone with you. Take out of your wasted honor Every little past frustration
Please join me in prayer. Loving God, we look to your word this morning for hope, for a promise of new beginnings and a world better than the one we see before us. Open our eyes to the new creation you present to us every day and open our hearts to accept your plans and the unending love that created them. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to explore the new thing that God is doing in our midst, we are moving on to the New Testament for our scripture reading this morning. I am reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. Let's listen to Paul's words. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is so good to be with you again as we worship together from our many different places. For those of you who are golf enthusiasts, you might like to know that the Illinois Open Championship Tournament is taking place on the course right outside our window this week. So we have a bird's eye view. And maybe, just maybe, we might receive an extra blessing today as a result of that. This summer has been so full of challenges it's neat to have something fun happening in our own backyard. With this message today, we're continuing on with our exploration of God's transforming power at work in the world, using ordinary people like you and me to do some pretty extraordinary things on behalf of God's people. Over the last couple of months, we have been tracing the history of God's activity through some of our Old Testament stories in the Bible. As God was continually at work creating new life, new relationships, new hope, and vision for his people. Who will ever forget Jacob wrestling with the angel, Moses being called through that burning bush, Joshua finding the courage to lead God's people into the promised land, Ruth trusting in God's provision. Elijah being lifted up from his despair. Esther saving her people. And last week, Ezekiel prophesying to a bunch of dead bones only to witness those dead bones rising up to new life as God breathed his spirit into them. New life. New creation. That is what God brings to every new generation of believers. And that is a message we desperately need to hear and hold on to during this difficult season in life for all of us. So with that in mind, it is timely and with great anticipation that we now turn to the New Testament to the witness of God's ultimate transforming act, God sending his only son into the world in love to save it, to transform it into a new creation in Christ that would change the course of history forever. That act of love, that act of grace, makes all the difference in the world for God's beloved creation today. All the difference in the world for people like you and me who are looking for new life, new joy, new hope in the midst of the challenges we are facing right now. A new creation in Christ. What does that look like? I want to begin by focusing in on our own personal journey of faith. The transformation that takes place as we open up our hearts and our lives completely to Jesus Christ and the message that he brings. 
There is no one better able to lead us into the joy of that transformation than the Apostle Paul, whose life was changed dramatically through his encounter with Jesus many centuries ago. Through that encounter and the relationship that ensued from it, Paul's whole perspective on life changed. His beliefs, his thinking, his actions, and ultimately his heart. He became a new man, a different man, a new creation, if you will. Paul describes the change that took place in him in the passage that we just heard a few minutes ago from his letter to the Corinthians. In that description, Paul identifies two things that happened for him, two things that happened for all of us when Jesus enters into our lives and makes himself known. The first is that we are given eyes to see Jesus as more than just a mere human being who walked this earth showing us how to live. As important as that that is, there is something more. We are given eyes to see beyond that into the deep mystery of Jesus' divine nature, God's very own being in human form. It is this mysterious union of his humanity and divinity that accomplishes God's mission of restoring the love connection, the personal relationship that God so desires to have with each and every one of us. Restores the the love connection that God desires for us all to have with one another. As Paul says, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him in that way. Nor do we view one another that way. When Christ enters our lives, Everything changes as he takes up residence deep within us. There is a new creation, a transformation that takes place that enables us to live in communion, not only with God, but with one another every day. Christ reconciles us. That's the word that Paul uses. Christ reconciles us to God to himself, and he reconciles us to one another. He restores our relationships, breaking down the walls that divide us, overcoming the sin that separates us. And in the process of that transformation, we are moved from a self-centered life to a God-centered or a Christ-centered life. As Christ becomes our center, we are then empowered to become his ambassadors, his representatives. As those ambassadors, we are called to spread this message of reconciliation, spread the good news of Christ overcoming our sin, overcoming the sin of the world to make all things new. I cannot think of a more poignant or needed message for the time we are in right now. As I tuned into a portion of John Lewis's memorial service last week, I was reminded of Paul's description here of this ministry of reconciliation. Lewis was a man of deep faith, a passionate advocate for justice and reconciliation, for the healing of relationships across our nation. He was a firm believer in the power of Christ's love to heal and to make new. In a remarkable piece he wrote just a few days before he died, he left a message. Never hate, he said, because hate is too heavy a burden to bear. Walk with the wind and let the spirit of peace, the power of everlasting love, be your guide. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem this world of ours. He firmly believed that. All things become possible as we enter into that deep place of divine communion with Christ and one another. So we must never lose hope, never give up in the face of the challenges that continue to come our way in life, 
As Lewis reminds us, we have a faith that assures us that everything is going to be all right. The second thing that happened for Paul as he became a new creation in Christ is that he came to recognize that there is a power greater than his own at work in this world. As he says in verses 17 and 18, and I quote from the message, we no longer look at the outer person. We look inside now, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone. A new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from God. Those are the words I want to underline. All this comes from God. As Pastor Jess said last week, contrary to what we would like to think, we do not have the power to create new life on our own. We cannot change or transform ourselves, let alone other people in the world around us, in our own power. Only God through Christ can bring the new life we all long for, the abundant, joy-filled life that God desires for each and every one of us. I don't know about you, but I have to be reminded of that truth often. By the grace of God, I have a spiritual director up at my favorite retreat center in Canada that does just that. I talk to her once a month. She has been one of my lifelines during this COVID-19 season. Every time I bring her my struggles, she reminds me of who is in control of my life and the lives of those around me. You're trying too hard, Barbara, she often says to me. Just give it all to God. Let God work in you. Let God work in the situations that are concerning you right now. God's got this. Jesus is with you. He knows what you are feeling. He's not surprised by what is happening. He is at work creating new life, even though you may not be able to fully see or comprehend it right now. There was a moment after our last conversation when I was moved to fall to my knees in prayer and do just that. I turned everything over to Christ. As I did so, a wonderful sense of peace and serenity came over me. I could actually feel God doing a new thing in me, creating some new life in that moment. Over the years, there have been numerous times when I've been driven to my knees in complete surrender to God. And I have come to understand that the regular release of control is necessary for living a Christ-centered life. It has never come easily for me, I confess, but I continue to grow in trust just a little bit more every day, every year. And for that, I am so very grateful. I've also learned over the years that it's important to have friends and companions who will share the journey of faith with you, both the joys and the sorrows. That's the gift that we give to one another as we share life together at River Glen. I've asked Len Bogacki now, one of those companions, to tell, a little, tell you a little bit about his faith journey during this time. Good morning, everyone. Here we are, about to head into week 21 of COVID, the pandemic that affects you and me and Aurora and Naperville and the entire world. It would have been impossible to imagine a moment like this a year ago, and words often fail to help me and those I pray for stay strong or take heart or find comfort in this situation. Sometimes when I'm looking for words, I look around and I see this framed picture I have in our living room. So the first reaction, if I'm being honest, first reaction to this is hypocritically 
to scoff at the idea, right? I know I often sing of surrender and peace and hope and joy, but I also struggle in those Jesus take the wheel moments to truly let go. I work on projects around our home the same way. If it doesn't fit, jam it in with brute force, right? As so often happens, that ends up causing more of a problem, making things worse. The truth is that we've never really been in the driver's seat. As Christians, we're called to remind ourselves and each other that God is in control. The analogy I often use is to imagine being in the back of one of those old-fashioned station wagons, the kind with the bench seat that faces backwards. As a kid, I used to love climbing into that sanctuary to have an opportunity to see things in a completely different way. Sometimes we'd go over some nasty bumps in that car. For us in back, all we had was a jolt or a painful sensation before we could really tell what happened. Then a pothole might come into view or a rut in the road. We felt it before we could understand it. It's the same way right now for a lot of us, isn't it? 20 weeks in, I'm feeling the pain of losing not one, but two jobs. Some of you have had bigger bumps in your road. Financial hardship, strain on relationships, anxiety about being in fellowship with your friends and your neighbors, the loss of someone close. Those are pretty big bumps. They're pretty nasty. But here's the beauty part. God's driving. He's taking us down an unfamiliar road. And we've been down unfamiliar roads before. And as those bumps come into focus, they will, though it doesn't always seem like it, become smaller and smaller with the passing of, of time un until they become less painfully significant, until we have to say goodbye to them. Let's go back to my tree for a second. So here's the thing about this tree. It can't get up and walk away when the drought comes. It's at the mercy of the wind. It's at the mercy of the rain. And still it shows us that no matter what the season is, it reaches for the sky. May we all be so reminded in the same manner today and in all the days ahead. Amen. Thank you, Len. I love Len's image of the tree reaching for God. How comforting to know that as we are reaching for God, God is also reaching for us. I'm envisioning this great big God hug where we are all held together in the love of Jesus Christ. And in that embrace we are refreshed and strengthened by Jesus' Spirit as He engenders new life, new hope, and new possibility within us all. As Len suggests, new creation can take place in all seasons of life, no matter how difficult they may be. We are not defined by what is going on around us, but rather what, by what God is doing in our hearts. That's what's going to determine the course of history from this moment on. So I encourage us all just to relax into that great big hug today and receive everything that God intends to give to us. May we let go and turn everything over to Jesus, our burdens, our worries, our failures, our sin, everything. Let's trust him to transform and make all things new to the praise of his glory. May we let go and let God take over, the Jesus take over the wheel of our life. 
May we come to know the love of Jesus Christ, the joyful, abundant life he brings to all of creation. As Christ's ambassadors, we have been entrusted with this message of reconciliation. We have been entrusted with the very presence, the very power of our risen Lord. May we move forward with the confidence and the assurance that God's got this, that God's got us, and everything will be all right. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word that reminds us that you are at work in us every day creating new life. We confess that sometimes, much to our own detriment, we are reluctant to let go and surrender to you. So to honor you in this sacred moment, we fall to our knees and release everything to you. We give you our fears, our worries, our disappointments, our doubts, our sin, everything that burdens us right now. We give it all to you. We ask that you would draw us into that deep place of communion where transformation takes place. Make us a new creation in you this day so that we might become your ambassadors and glorify your holy name. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of the church, a community that you have gathered to worship, pray, serve, and love. Give us strength to live as ambassadors for you in the world. Lord, bless your church and keep us pure. Make your face to shine upon us. Turn your face towards us and give us peace in this time. We pray for your whole church throughout the world. Give us courage in the midst of storms so that we can see and hear Jesus calling, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. May we follow Christ wherever he leads. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for your whole church throughout the world. And we pray for the nations and their leaders. In you, steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace combine. May all nations in conflict, not only with each other, but conflicts that exist within them, know the peace that is the fruit of justice and the justice that is the path to peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We also pray for a world that so desperately needs God in the midst of hurricanes, unfathomable explosions, and an uncertain future. We lift up to you those facing decisions about their education or work, those affected in Beirut, and those who have made it through the storm on the, along the East Coast, and all your people throughout the world that still need resources that we so often take for granted. May we always remember that we are your hands and feet in this world, and that we meet those needs as servants together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us also as we pray together the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have two announcements this week. One is that our mission to Longwood School continues this summer. On Thursday night of this coming week, that would be August 13th, we're having what we're calling a drive-through luau from 5 to 6.30 p.m., where we are asking people to bring a new backpack to donate or cash to purchase one and grab a delicious boxed luau dinner to take home and enjoy. See your e-news for additional details and sign up. Also, next week's worship is outside on the church lawn at 6.30 p.m. It's a little warm and sunny at 10.30, so we're aiming for the evening. Please bring your own chairs and masks. At 10.30 next Sunday morning, instead of YouTube, join us for Zoom Fellowship, where Pastor Jess will provide for a time of check-in, joys and concerns, and host a discussion on the worship themes of the outdoor service that evening. And now, as ambassadors for Christ, let us share the good news we have heard this morning with the world. As we do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you.